Welcome to Transformed by Grace, an in-depth Bible study of God's Word, presented by the Berean Bible Society. Join us each time on this station as Pastor Kevin brings the transforming message of God's grace revealed through the Holy Scriptures. One author wrote this about the account we're going to look at together. The man couldn't walk. He couldn't stand. His limbs were bent and his body twisted. A waist-high world walked past as he sat and watched. Whether he was born paralyzed or became paralyzed, the end result was the same, total dependence on others. Someone had to wash him. He couldn't blow his nose or go on a walk. When he ran, it was in his dreams, and his dreams would always awaken to a body that couldn't roll over and couldn't go back to sleep for all the hurt that the dream had brought. When people looked at him, they didn't see the man. They saw a body in need of a miracle. And that's certainly what his friends saw. So they did what any of us would do for a friend. They tried to get him some help. By the time his friends arrived at the place, the house was full. People jammed the doorways. Kids sat in the windows. Others peeked over shoulders. How would this small band of friends ever attract Christ's attention? They had to make a choice. Do we go in or do we give up? What would have happened had the friends given up? What if they had shrugged their shoulders and mumbled something about the crowd being big and dinner getting cold and turned and left? After all, they had done a good deed in coming this far. Who could fault them for turning back? You can only do so much for someone. But these friends hadn't done enough. One said that he had an idea. The four huddled over the paralytic and created the plan to climb to the top of the house, cut through the roof, and lower their friend down. It was risky. They could fall. It was dangerous. He could fall. It was unorthodox. The roofing is against the norm. It was intrusive. Christ was busy with all these people, but it was their only chance. So they climbed to the roof. Faith does these things. Faith is ingenious. It does the unexpected, the risky, the unorthodox. And faith gets God's attention. Mark 2, 1 to 2 reads, And again he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noised that he was in the house. And straightway many were gathered together, insomuch that there was no room to receive them, no, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. This account takes place in Capernaum, located on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. This account takes place in Capernaum. Capernaum was located on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. Earlier in Capernaum, the Lord had cast out a demon from a man in the synagogue and healed Peter's mother-in-law. Following this, he went throughout Galilee, preaching, healing, and casting out demons. Here in verse 1, we see that the Lord returned to Capernaum. Word got out quickly that the Lord was in town, and as the word got out, the people immediately came. They came from every direction. And as it's been said, they came like soldiers returning from battle, bandaged, crippled, sightless. The deaf, the diseased, the mute, the barren all came. And not only did the sick come, but we find that curiosity seekers were also there and religious leaders were in the crowd. Mark stresses how great the multitude of people was by saying that there was no room to receive anymore and that the crowd was not so much as about the door or that there were so many people you couldn't even get near the door of the house. The house is Peter's house. In the context of this book, the only house mentioned in Capernaum in the book of Mark was the house of Simon and Andrew in chapter 1, verse 29. As Christ ministered to the crowd, verse 2 says, out of his love and out of his concern for them, he preached the word to them. He taught them from the Jewish scriptures, the law of Moses, the prophets, the wisdom writings. But it shows what people need the most that by the Lord's actions here, we learn that people need the Word of God most of all. The Word was the priority to the Lord here. 
Mark 2, 3-5 reads, And they come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. Right in the middle of the Lord's preaching of the word, something happens. Four men bring their paralyzed friend to Christ. They come fully believing that if they can get this man to the Lord, that he was able to heal his body. They had the faith to believe that Christ would and could meet his need. The severity of the man's paralysis is seen by the fact that he could not walk. He was totally immobile, confined to a stretcher. The paralytic was unable to come to Christ himself, but he was fortunate enough to have four friends who were able to get him to the Lord. This passage teaches us of the blessing of having friends with faith, which is so crucial to have in life. In the local church, the Lord provides us with the opportunity to form and create relationships and to have friendships with people of faith. It's a blessing to have people who are there for you, ready to assist, to pray for you, to serve one another in time of need like these men did for the paralytic. When the four men with the paralytic arrive at the house, they find that the crowd is so large that they cannot get, get into the house or to the Lord through the front door. These men were deeply concerned about their friend. They wanted to see him help, and they refused to allow difficult circumstances to cause them to give up hope of getting their friend to the Lord. So they worked together, they put their heads together, did some creative thinking, and dared to do something very unusual. Necessity is the mother of invention, as it's been said. And so they decided to climb the outside staircase of the house, locate the ceiling directly above the Lord's head, and break through the roof and lower the stretcher. Uh, that is bearing their friend right in front of the Lord. Now, houses in that day were usually constructed with flat roofs. A set of stairs on the side of the house allowed access to the roof, which was used much like we use a deck in, in our culture. They were used for relaxation in the cool of the day, for sleeping even on hot nights in that time. These roofs were usually made by laying timbers across the top of the house. These timbers were then covered by a layer of branches. Then this was covered by a layer of clay slabs or hardened dry, dried clay tiles. And finally, a coat of fresh wet clay was spread and rolled over those slabs of hardened clay to serve as a seal against the rain. So the words uncovered the roof that you read in verse 4 and broke it up in verse 4. Now all that involved a lot of effort and it involved work. This was no easy job. So I like to imagine the scene that Christ is teaching in the middle of this house. These four men arrive carrying their friend. When they couldn't get in the front door, they go up the stairs on top of the roof. Once there, they begin to dig through the roof, digging out that top coat of clay removing and tearing away several of the clay slabs, pulling and tugging and pushing at all the underlying branches and timbers until they've made an opening large enough. And then you imagine the crowd inside the house at first hearing the racket up on the roof as they begin breaking up the roof for their hole. And then the debris from the roof beginning to rain down on them and clamoring and struggling to get out of the way inside the house. The crowd's amazed at what's taking place. And then I think about Peter and his wife, you know, who were likely distraught, wondering if their homeowner's insurance was going to cover the cost of this repair. And then all of a sudden, blue sky is seen, and sunlight comes into the darkness of the home from the hole in that roof. Particles of dust hanging in the air from the roof deconstruction. A stream of light is blocked as the friends swing the stretcher over the hole and they begin to lower their friend into the room. People start shuffling as much as they could inside the tight spaces in the house to get out of the way, to allow room for the stretcher to be put onto the floor. The paralyzed man is lowered right down in front of the Lord who's been watching the whole scene. 
Once the man is lowered, the whole room is quiet. The crowd is silent, waiting to see what will happen next. The whole room waits expectantly, looking at the Lord. What will he say? What will he do? And then up above the whole scene are four happy, smiling, hopeful friends looking down at it all from their hole. I imagine with their feet dangling through the hole as they're watching. These were four determined men who had enough love for their friend and enough faith in the Lord that they were willing to take a chance and risk embarrassment and injury to get him to the Lord. They could have given up because of the logistics and difficulties of the scenario. They had a legitimate excuse. It's too full, too crowded. There's no way in. But they had a faith that refused to quit in the face of obstacles. Their friend couldn't walk, so they carried him. The crowd blocked their access to Christ, so they went around them. The roof was in the way, so they tore a hole in it. The men had gone to extraordinary lengths to place their friend before the Lord because they believed, firmly believed, he possessed authority over illness, believing no disease, no dysfunction was too difficult for him to cure. And in their faith, they dared to do what was difficult, to put work and effort behind their faith. These men were willing to do whatever it took to bring that man to the Lord. In their heart, needs to beat within us because the account emphasizes the need for our bringing to Christ people if they are ever going to, going to come to Him. The number one reason by far that people try a church is because a friend invites them. It's not a flyer in the mail. It's not catchy TV, radio, or newspaper advertising. It's not Google. The number one reason by far is that a friend invited them or brought them. And these four men are examples of friends helping needy sinners to come to the Savior. And that's a true friend because you're looking out for their greatest need to get them under the hearing of the gospel. That hole in the ceiling, I like to think about that hole. Because that broken roof is a picture of love. And you might have a friend, a coworker, a neighbor, a family member, and you say, there is no way that they'll come to Christ. Or if I ask them, there's no way they'll come to church. But like these men, by their example, we should not give up. We should not give up in doing whatever it takes to try to think creatively like these men did to get this man in front of the Lord. Sometimes we need to think creatively. These men brought their friend to the Lord and we need to have the kind of faith and zeal these men had in doing so. Faith that goes through the roof. The zeal to tear apart a roof to get people to the Lord. Because that's how desperate the situation is. That people need Christ before it's too late. Verse 5 says that Christ saw their faith. And the Lord loves to see people act in faith. The active, persistent effort of the paralytic's friends was visible evidence of their faith in Christ to heal. And Christ was moved by that faith. Christ helps the paralytic patient in response to the faith of his friends and bringing him in front of him. Christ had healed before by a word, a touch of the hand, and the sick were immediately restored to perfect health. But on this occasion, Christ did something different, and he stuns the crowd by saying, Son, your sins are forgiven you. The friends wanted him to heal their friend, but Christ wouldn't settle for a simple healing of the body. He wanted to heal the soul. Christ leapfrogged the physical and dealt with the spiritual. To heal the body is temporal. To heal the soul is eternal. The expectations of the friends and, the, and of the crowd aren't high enough. They expect Christ to say you're healed. Instead, he says you're forgiven. They expect to see him to treat what they see, the body. He chooses to treat what they can't see the spiritual, because that's what he sees. And that was 
the focus of his coming to this world. And so the Lord addresses the man's greater need first, and he asserts a prerogative that was God's alone. We'll be returning to the program in just a minute, but first we'd like to take this time to thank you, our partners, for making these programs possible. If you would like to access our library of helpful Bible study tools, go to BereanBibleSociety.org. Growing Up in Grace, Bible Events, Book One. In this book, students will discover God's plan for mankind as they study the real life events recorded in Genesis and Exodus. The lessons in this teacher's manual show how God demonstrated his power, extended his mercy, judged unbelief, and blessed those who believed and obeyed him. Every lesson devotes time for Bible reading and memorization for students, object lessons, review games, and practical application of biblical truth, and ends with a presentation of the gospel and encouragement for students to study and apply the instruction they've received from God's Word. To order your copy, contact the Berean Bible Society for pricing and availability at 262-255-4750 or visit our website at www.bereanbiblesociety.org. To receive our free full-color 32-page monthly magazine, The Berean Searchlight, call 262-255-4750 or subscribe online at www.bereanbiblesociety.org. Thank you again for your generous gifts. And now, back to the teaching with Pastor Kevin. Mark 2, verses 6 to 7 read, But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why doth this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? Christ's reputation had spread, and now the scribes and Pharisees were watching him closely and critically. These men were given preferential treatment here. They were in the middle of Peter's house with the Lord with front row seats, for the Lord's preaching and for the, the miracles he was performing. When Christ said, Son, your sins are forgiven you, they immediately understood the enormous implications of that declaration. And he was silently accused of blasphemy by these religious leaders as they reasoned within themselves and within their minds and hearts. One writer insightfully said this, now, unless the speaker is God, forgiving sins is preposterous. We can all understand how a man forgives offenses against himself. You step on my toe, and I forgive you. You steal my money, and I forgive you. But what should we make of a man, himself unrobbed and untrodden on, who announced that he forgave you for treading on another man's toes and stealing other men's money? Yet this is what Jesus did. He told people that their sins were forgiven and never waited to consult all the other people whom their sins had undoubtedly injured. He unhesitatingly behaved as if he was the party chiefly concerned, the person chiefly offended in all offenses. This makes sense only if he was, really was God, whose laws are broken and whose love is wounded in every sin. Telling the paralytic his sins were forgiven was Christ claiming to be God. But in every way, Christ did have that authority to forgive sins because he is God. In Isaiah 43, 25, the Lord said, I, even I, am he that blotteth out thy transgressions for mine own sake and will not remember thy sin. The scribes are correct here. They are in their reasoning that who can forgive sins but God only? But they are incorrect in thinking that Christ blasphemed. Instead of reasoning, he claims to forgive. Only God forgives. Therefore, he must be God. They instead reasoned, this man cannot be God, thus he is blaspheming. They failed to consider the possibility that Jesus Christ was indeed God. Mark 2, 8 to 12 reads, And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your hearts? 
Whether is it easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise, and take up thy bed and walk? But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, he saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, and take up thy bed, and go thy way into thine house. And immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed, and glorified God, saying, We never saw it in this fashion. In verse 8, we see how Christ, the all-knowing God, supernaturally perceived in his spirit, knew the reasoning and objections taking place in the scribes' thoughts. Since they were reasoning in their hearts, Christ gives them something else to ponder. A proof test of his identity results from this, and Christ addresses their concerns directly with an intriguing and wise challenge. He asks the religious leaders present, which is easier, to tell the man his sins are forgiven or tell him to stand up and take up his bed and walk? Both statements required divine authority and power, and Christ was going to show he had power to do both as God. Either of those statements is easy to make, but only one can be proved. So their reasoning would have been for them to think that it's easier to say that your sins are forgiven, because nobody can prove or disprove whether or not the forgiveness really took place. So the Lord was pointing out that it would be easy for someone to say that another's sins are forgiven. No one could prove any differently. But the harder thing would be to heal a hopeless case of a bedridden, paralyzed man. Commanding a paralytic to walk would be more difficult to say because the actions of the paralytic would immediately verify the effect of the command. If he said, get up and walk, and he didn't, it would expose powerlessness. Therefore, to offer visual validation for the more difficult statement and to prove his power and authority both to forgive sin and to heal paralysis as God, Christ says the more difficult statement. But before he did, to be certain that no one missed the significance of his action, he says, so that you the religious leaders, that is, may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. I say to you, the paralytic, get up, pick up your bed, and go to your house. And by the power of the word that spoke the universe into existence, no sooner did the Lord issue that command that the paralyzed man immediately got up right away in front of them all, picked up his stretcher, and walked through that crowd and went to his house. And Luke says that as he stood up and headed home, he went glorifying God. And we can be sure he was jumping and shouting as he glorified God. And then I remember, and then you remember those four friends. Seeing this take place through this broken roof. And then I imagine them running home with him, jumping and shouting with him all the way home to Christ used the physical to prove the spiritual. He proved that he had the authority to speak one thing, your sins are forgiven, by doing the other, healing the paralytic. If he gave the command and the paralytic just continued to lie there, then Christ would be proven to be unable to heal or forgive sin. But when that man stood up, it showed the truthfulness of his authority as God to forgive sins because he is 100% God. The people present were amazed. They glorified God. This is what Christ wanted when they glorified God, because that's what he came for, to give glory to the Father through his obedience. They then said, we never saw it on this fashion, or we've never seen anything like this before. And Luke says that the people were saying, we have seen strange things today. The response is non-committal, not void of wonder and amazement, but void of faith in Christ. The Lord's miracles demonstrated His deity and His compassion for people in need. And they also revealed important spiritual lessons about salvation. They were object lessons to teach what God could do 
if only they would believe in God's Son. And we learn in this miracle of Christ's authority as God to be able to forgive sin. Surely the paralyzed man, the four who brought him in the crowd, thought that his greatest problem was paralysis. But Christ knew the truth. Sin was his greatest problem, and he dealt with that first. Sin is the greatest problem for all of us. Because of sin, each of us are broken. We have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And we all need forgiveness in life. And if we do not have our sins paid for and forgiven, sin will separate us forever from the presence of God. Christ's purpose in coming to the earth was to bring forgiveness of sin through the payment for our sins at the cross. Forgiveness of our sins and salvation is the greatest miracle of all because it meets the greatest need. And it costs the greatest price by Christ shedding his blood at the cross. And it brings also the greatest blessing, the most lasting results, eternal results of being able to spend eternity in the presence of God. If you need salvation and the forgiveness of all your sins, you must come to the Lord Jesus Christ to find the complete forgiveness that you need. Complete forgiveness is available to all by the cross, and it's offered to all and anyone and everyone by grace through faith alone. Ephesians 1, 7 says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Just believing that Christ died for you personally and rose again, you are saved and you are forgiven all of your sins. All sin, past, present, and future, they're gone and forgiven. We each need Christ's forgiveness. And then after receiving it by faith alone, we need to be like these four guys and carry our friends to meet the Lord so they can find forgiveness in Him. We should follow their example of faith and love that we would be willing to break through a roof if we have to, to do whatever it takes to bring others to the Savior. Thank you again for tuning in to Transformed by Grace. We appreciate your prayer support and the financial gifts. The purpose and mission of the Berean Bible Society is to help you understand the whole counsel of the Word of God. For more information, visit our website at www.bereanbiblesociety.org or give us a call at 262-255-4750. Or if you prefer, write us at the Berean Bible Society, P.O. Box 756, Germantown, Wisconsin, 53022. Now until next time, may you be transformed by God's grace.